Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters for their support. The Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board and the Dairy Farm Families of Wisconsin, Outpost Natural Foods Co-op, and Superior Equipment and Supply. Malone's head cheese has become a standard in that style of delicacy. But what's even more engaging, perhaps, is the story of the Malone family. Glorious and her husband were both products of the Great Migration and opened a small grocery store here in this near north side neighborhood of Milwaukee. In the back room, they essentially made this delicacy for friends and family. That grocery store grew to a bigger one, and eventually, the head cheese business really drove the ship and moved into a 12,000 square foot building here in that same neighborhood. They're now two generations deep and Glorious's daughter Daphne runs the business. It's a true Wisconsin story, it's a true American multi-generational story and it's really delicious. Hi, I'm Daphne Jones from Malone's Fine Sausage. We create gourmet pork delicacies that are 100% meat and spices and they're created for the enjoyment of people who enjoy flavors. Our signature product are our hot and mild gourmet head cheese. And we've also added new signatures, which is our country pâtés. Our head cheese is a southern rendition. My parents are both from the south. My father from Tennessee, my mother from Louisiana. So their, their idea is from their roots. Um, it's a recipe that is really all over the world, but ours is um, meat and spices and uh, lots of love. So our head cheese is basically a meaty pork delicacy. Our intention is to use the meatiest, the, the best of the meaty. So for us, the meatiest and the most, the most precious pieces were for the snout and the ears, and we were able to make that a really nice combination. So how long have you been putting a coat like this on? I've been doing this full time for over seven years now. Every often on for over 650-ish. 50-ish. You don't look a day over 35. I love you. <laughs> We're keeping him. <laughs> go see some head cheese. Let's go see some head cheese. Enough of this sweet talk. <laughs> Come on in. Whoa! This is war yummy flavor in the air. I bet you don't even have to pay these guys just because it smells so good and feels so good in here. It's a great place to be. Yeah! <laughs> So this is our cook room, our, this is our super duper mixture room. Okay. So we're going to prepare everything, then we're going to, as you're seeing there, they're going to drop it, empty, empty the basket. So that's snouts and ear meat. Meat, yes. And you put it in here, and how is it cooked? It's just simply, it's just simply boiled. It's boiled in water? Correct. Is there a certain amount of time they boil it, and that's proprietary, and I shouldn't even ask? Until it's done. <laughs> Homespun wisdom is the best. I know you're yeah. it against the wall, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> so what he's doing right there is what? So now we're preparing, this is going to be a mild batch. So okay. we're making a mild batch this time. So he's adding in the spices. Yes. Is it super proprietary or is it something that anybody could make but no one could get it right the way you guys do? I think it's a see all the above. It is proprietary and then no one can make it the way we all make it. Yeah. yeah. Well, my parents uh, began the business from the from our home into the grocery store on Six and Hadley, and and when my father passed, my mother outgrew. Six and Hadley, then she moved to 17th and Center, and when she outgrew that space, she wanted to build. And she could have built a 
plant anywhere, but she wanted to come here because she wanted it to be a light for people to see that anything can be done if you work hard and you just really stick to it. So she wanted to be inspiration for the community. She wanted to be a collection, a combination, a binding for the city. And her dream was for it to always stand here to be a testament of love and determination. Oh, instantly my glasses come back from the steam. Ah, That's you can nice. see it again. Yeah. So now we've taken the product into the chill blast. Mm -hmm. It's gonna drop the temperature really fast so it doesn't have chance to do pathogen things. Yeah, I, all the pathogens gonna... in me are dying right now. It's cold in here. <laughs> So this is where it's going to set in this in this chill blast, and then it'll be there for the night. So that's just so, one big refrigerator. One big refrigerator, indeed. Well, once we come take the packages out of the chill blast, now we're going to take it over to the cutting machine so that we can slice it into the portions that we're going to package today. Today we're going to package one pounders. So with that machine there, they're going to get the portions that we need. I call this a, a slice of one pounder. A slice of love. I thought you guys slice called it a love. slice of love. Slice of love. That happens to be one pound. One pound. Just happens you, you know to be what one this reminds? This is like gold bricks right here. It's I like the way you think. Fort, Fort Knox of head cheese. I Doesn't think we should look, change some names. <laughs> they are. They're like gold bricks, except they're they're kind of tan and yummy, and I know how good they smell from the room next door. Mm -hmm. Give, give me some toast. Somebody, <laughs> give me some toast. And then when we're ready, we'll take these packages to the labeling area. We'll put labels on it. You got to put that famous Glorious Malone put name on it. Famous Glorious so they can recognize yeah. the label. Yeah, yeah. And then we're going to fill orders for our customers and get those gold bars out to them right away. And this is the mild, right? And that's the mild, the yes. The spice is a little bit more red. You can see it from a distance. Right, yes. Yeah. How hot is the hot? Well, it depends on your hot palate. It might be just temperate for a hot person, but I'm it a, might be really spicy for a person who really likes mild. I'm a little bit of a wimp when it comes to hot. I and gotta be honest. you might like the mild better. Stick but I will mild. actually try the hot, just yeah. to be sure. I will with you if you hold my hand. I will. <laughs> I will. And I would really, really be honored if you would try. Some Honey of Bunch, our I skipped breakfast because I knew I was coming. I love this. <laughs> I love this. Come with me. Come this way. I'm coming. I'm coming. of yumminess. I love the tour, but I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm a little proprietary here in this part. I'm sort of, this is what I've been looking forward to. Let me tell you about these. So this is our, gonna be our mild plate. Okay. And this is our hot flavors. Head cheese is, is, used, is really a universal recipe. There is a recipe all over the world for it. So it's a global, it's a global cuisine, it's just, regionally, within countries, and then all over continents, everybody made head cheese. It's really an honoring the animal dish. Yes. What's special about southern head cheese versus, I don't know, wild boars out in the west or something like that where they would make it? I think it's the, the blend, the way we make it, the spices that we use. I think it's the way that we, the pieces that we, that we decided to use, and the fact that that's all there is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, there is nothing added to it. There's no preservatives. It's no clean additives, in that sense. No. Yeah. There are so few things in our food systems now that are that, are that way. So few. So, all right, I'm going to have a piece while I ask you more questions about your mom. So your parents had this store going, and it was kind of a, it was a cornerstone in the neighborhood for, for it some, was for yeah, right? Quite some time. Yeah. And then when my uh, father passed in the six, in 63, then my mom began to run the business um, all the time. 
So she was still making the product there, but she actually was making it so much that they didn't realize people were coming across state lines for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Had cheese contraband. I know. <laughs> so people were buying it and buying it, and then the inspectors got wind of it, and they came to visit her one day, mm -hmm. and she, they asked her about this famous product, and she was very proud, and she said, well, No fear. No fear. So she said, Well, yes. And they wanted to know, had she made it? And she said, Well, yes, I did. And she went and showed them where it was, and they told her they had to destroy it because oh. um, they were the inspectors, and she wasn't licensed to, you know, to produce and sell. So she became the first African American woman to become federally inspected. Which is really cool, but she was, I mean, the neighborhood counted on her, so she was going to make this with love, and, and no one was going to, I mean, talk about food safety to the nth degree. Nth degree. Yeah. She was yeah. very particular. Yeah. So you are really, these are big shoes to fill. Yes, I think so. Yeah, and you started filling them in 2005. Uh, yes, and I actually officially came in in 2006 when she actually became very ill and she couldn't work here yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, but you're carrying the torch. I am. Pretty cool. I am very happy to be able to do it. All right, we, let's toast with crackers. Which one? I want to see which one you're going to try here. Well, I like them all. <laughs> Spoken like a true CEO. So I actually want to try this one. You're going to go with the party, the jazzy hot the jazzy party in your mouth. Hot the party in the mouth. Okay, and you always say think outside the cracker, but I we're going. Do. This is the classic head cheese way, right? Cheers. Cheers. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, I don't know if this is spices, if it's just because it's snouts and ears, if it's a love, but there's almost nothing more flavorful. It's such a wonderful, magical mm -hmm. gift. It's soft. It's got that great pork slightly off all. There's a little bit of salt. I don't know what you guys are doing with the spices, but it's just right. A little bit right. of little bit of texture. Smooth, smooth. You know what this reminds me of in a different way? It's like when you're feeling kind of crummy and your mom makes you a bowl of oatmeal mm -hmm. and it just sets you straight. Mm -hmm. That's what this is only with pork on a cracker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to use that too. Oh man. <laughs> and then the spices that you guys have, I mean you guys should be teaching classes because it's balanced. It's just like boom, boom, boom. Steps down across Flavor your palate. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, a, a great great, great idea. Yeah. And I'm glad they decided to not just only share it with friends or relatives. <laughs> just so you know, I'm kind of a fan of the, what would it be, HCLT instead of the BLT. The ACLT? I H -C -L -T. love that idea. Yeah. I'm going to use that too. Oh man, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me over. Thanks for coming. You bet. Lunch here again tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Same place. Same, same place. Station. Just set up the sunroom. We can do that. Yeah, Piece shut down cake. the office for a minute. We can do it. Good, good. Let's plan it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Peter Adams with Milwaukee Firkin Craft Beer Festival. Let me grab one of these from you, sir. We started it about four years ago with the intent of celebrating Milwaukee's brewing heritage. It started out with about 1,000 people the first year, and now it's grown to about 16, 1,700. So, as you can see, a lot of people in Milwaukee love craft beer, and we hope to keep growing that. There's, there's beer in these cakes. Whoa! Hi there, my name is George Breger. Uh, we're here at Firkenfest. Uh, we're here a little bit early today to get set up because we're actually serving. That looks good, that looks right. A couple of our uh, first seasonal beers, which we had brewed at Three Sheeps in Sheboygan. Uh, we're really excited to be doing Firkenfest. This is the first time we've actually done this festival. 
So what we brought today is uh, basically a farmhouse style ale. But we used a really unique ingredient um, that's actually from the coffee farm. That ingredient's called cascara. And what cascara is, is it's actually the skin or the peel off of a coffee cherry when uh, the coffee cherry gets processed at the uh, farm. And it sort of has this kind of green tea flavor, sort of like green tea mixed with um, kind of an herbal, fruity character, basically. We gotta serve this, can't we just keep it for ourselves? Eventually. Birkin Fest came about, we, we at Easttown Association were thinking about doing a beer festival. And as circumstances would have it, Kurt was thinking about doing a beer festival in Milwaukee. So the stars kind of aligned and we wanted to do a beer festival. Kurt wanted to do one in Milwaukee. I think we were one of the first uh, t resurging beer, beer festivals in the city. So right. it was just a good relationship. So what is a firkin? Tell me. Uh, well, for, real quickly, the firkin origin came from, it was a unit of measurement. Right. So when people back in England, this where it started, wanted to get a, a, a container of lard or butter or something, flour, they would get it at a firkin. Yeah, but it was also used for beer. And uh, why it's important now is it kind of takes everybody back. It's cast condition ale. It's uh, naturally carbonated with a vent in the barrel, not CO2 or gas or nitrogen. And uh, so you get these very unique organic flavors. Yeah. And, uh, and, and people are looking for something new and different. They're not going to find this at the liquor store and they're not going to find it in many taverns. And it, like you said, it's a one-off so the brewmasters can let their creative juices flow and Exactly. And do a bacon bourbon beer like well, Hinterland, absolutely. which is delicious. I mean, there's a lot of real interesting takes on uh, the recipes that the brewers have that they've added to the Birkin. And, yeah. uh, so we won't see most of these next year. Yeah, yeah. which is the beauty of it. Right. It's kind of like Burning Man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's Set never it up the, and burn it down. Yep, never the same thing. <laughs> it always looks different the next time you do it. Yeah. Well, I'm Grant Pauley, uh, founder and brewmaster at Three Sheeps Brewing Company in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Key State Resistance for today is going to be our really squiddy water slides. We took our IPA, our best seller, uh, really cool water slides, and added squidding to it. I got this idea from pasta uh, that they do over in Italy that, where they blacken it with squidding. And I thought, let's try to make a black IPA with that. So we added it to it. Uh, we'll pour a sample here in a sec, I guess. Um, but it, it turned out nice. It's a little briny, and that just enhances the hop characteristics and flavor to it. And you get a good kind of slight seaweed uh, note on the nose. One of the fun things with Birkins is uh, when we put the ingredients together, we don't get to taste it ahead of time. So today was the first time we've had a chance to see how this guy was going to come out. And uh, it met the expectations. Yeah, nice and dark head cascading down to a black beer. So you can start to pick up the squid ink on the nose. You're getting a little of that brine, kind of seaweed sea characteristic. When you take a sip, it really just opens up that bitterness and makes it a little bigger than the really cool water slide normally is. The, the hops linger longer in the mouth, and you get, just get a very, very subtle salt flavor that uh, kind of helps bring everything together. It really just rounded out water slide and just made it a bigger beer. I'm Mike Brenner, the founder and brewmaster at Brenner Brewing Company. Brenner Brewing Company was an idea that I came up with about five years ago. I was home brewing in front of my art gallery in River West and decided there had to be a better way to support local artists, a more sustainable way. So I went back to school, got an MBA, went to Germany, got a master brewer diploma, and then I've been working my butt off coming up with recipes and raising money so that I can start my brewery. So today I've got a, a ton of different beers. The idea is just kind of give people a sample of different possibilities of what I might be releasing. So on Firkin today, I've got something a little bit different. I actually never brewed it before and a couple weeks ago I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. So I ended up doing a really chocolatey stout with oatmeal and cocoa nibs that also had strawberries kind of steeping in it for a couple days. And so it's kind of a, a chocolate covered strawberry stout. And once it warms up, you really get a lot of that chocolate and strawberry in it. And that's why it's really suited to a firkin, so it's not an ice cold beer. You really kind of lose a lot of that great flavor. Another beer I have that I'm really happy with is, I call it Affenkönig, which is German for Monkey King. And what the Monkey King is, is it's 
Another kind of German-inspired beer from my time studying brewing in Germany. In Munich, there's one brewery, Schneiderweise, that has a hoppy Weiss beer, which is really something that nobody else does. And so I wanted to do my take on it. And so I came up with a hoppy Weiss beer that's twice as strong at 8.1% and three times as hoppy than most Weiss beers. And I really tried to pull out the banana and the fruit flavors with the hops and the yeast so that I could kind of make it just something people wouldn't expect. And so a lot of what I try to do really is take a traditional style and do something a little bit different. A lot of it is about experimentation. How would you compare Milwaukee's beer knowledge to the other events that you've done in Wheaton uh, or you know, Illinois? Every or... single market that I do a, vest, a festival in is very unique and very different. But the common denominator with everybody is in a very short period of time, beer knowledge has gone from zero to up that scale. Right. And you, what, what you would have thought would have taken a decade has taken two, three years. And uh, It's because of that little invention from Al Gore, I think. Yeah, yeah the internet has yeah. uh, really helped propel this. I think though because it's local, I think because it's unique, and I think because it's a social yeah. uh, entity and all of the breweries we have are socially involved with their community and constituents, people want to be part of it. They want to be part of something that's fun and something that they feel the ownership in. I think years ago people in Milwaukee tended to shun and shy away from the culture of beer. They didn't want to be associated with Laverne and Shirley. Sure. But now I think it's coming full circle where people are realizing that that's a sense of pride and you should be proud of that I, heritage. I, I think Milwaukeeans should be. Yeah. I, and I, you've heard me say this before, you know, there's a lot of worse things to be known for. And you know, when you, when you hear about, when people talk about Milwaukee to an outsider, generally speaking, they don't have a negative impression. They, they think of Milwaukee as kind of this fun loving town. And I can't think of why Which that would be are. a negative. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, if you look around, this is exactly what we had hoped it would do. We're a giant beer garden. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Kurt. Thanks for taking some time to talk with it's us. It's been fun. It's yeah. been a great time. Working great. Working great. Working awesome. <laughs> Working outstanding. Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters for their support. The Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board and the Dairy Farm Families of Wisconsin. Outpost Natural Foods Co-op, Superior Equipment and Supply, the restaurants of Potawatomi Bingo Casino, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Something Special from Wisconsin, and Colectivo Coffee Roasters.